All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, Naomi Cedar is, uh, has been a, a long, t long time contributor to the Python community. Uh, she created the PyCon poster session. She created the PyCon Education Summit. Um, she has taught people how to program in Python in, in a variety of contexts. And she speaks in blogs both about Python and her experiences with gender transition in the tech community. And she is going to be talking with us today about Farewell and Welcome Home, Python in Two Genders. Please welcome Naomi Cedar. Oh my god. <laughs> OK. Uh, so I want to start with a disclaimer. Um, basically, what I'm going to be talking about is based on my experiences and my observations. Uh, there are kind of two reasons for this. Uh, one of them is maybe a little bit of a weasel in that uh, you can't call BS on this. This is my life. Uh, the other thing is that I want to make it clear that I cannot speak for all, all transgender people. I cannot speak for all trans women. I cannot speak for all white, late, middle-aged trans women from the Chicago area. Uh, I can really only speak for myself. This is an important point because uh, marginalized groups, people tend to assume that one of them represents all of them, and that's just not true. Uh, so this is, in fact, a very difficult talk for me to give. And it's very weird for me to be in this situation. I have been teaching and speaking for decades. Normally, uh, the back of an envelope and five minutes, and I'm good to talk for hours. Ask my former students. Um, so uh, this, in fact, I've, I've told my story a few times now, and it gets harder uh, every time. And I think part of that is that in spite of the disclaimer I just gave you, I'm afraid that people think I am speaking for a lot of other people and I'm really scared of screwing it up. Uh, the other thing, though, is this quote from Laverne Cox. Laverne is uh, a transgender actress who stars on Orange is the New Black, the Netflix series. She is also quickly becoming one of the leading uh, spokespeople for the transgender community. This is both the reason why I'm scared and this is the mantra that I've been clinging to in order to go through with this. It is revolutionary for any trans person to choose to be seen and visible in a world that tells us we should not exist. So this is, in fact, my revolutionary act. And part of my story is, in fact, the story of the world telling me all of my life that I should not, that I cannot exist. So to start a long time ago, and some of my friends have made fun of me starting back this far, uh, I was born in a small town in Nebraska, and the country doctor declared with great confidence, it's a boy. Unfortunately, he was wrong. In fact, I was transgender, and what this means, if you're not familiar with it, is that sometime before I was born, something very essential in the way that my brain works was set to female rather than male. Uh, I try to stay up to date on the literature and things like that, uh, but in fact, there is no clear explanation of this at this point. There are clearly genetic factors. There are also clearly epigenetic factors, timings of hormones, various things, but we don't know what causes it. There are probably multiple causes. And in a very important way, it doesn't matter. What matters is that I never chose to be transgender. I never chose to be born with a male body and a female brain, mind, whatever it is. Uh, I always just was. Now, as you might imagine, uh, even now, this is a hard thing, uh, in those days, in that time, this left me fairly confused. I knew that things weren't right. I also learned very quickly through fairly pervasive gender policing that I could never be a girl or with the girls or like the girls. Not like that, but I learned very, very quickly, and, and I'm talking about by like four or five, uh, that I could never even talk about it. Never, never, no one can know this. So you can imagine I was fairly confused uh, until eventually, uh, you know, 
when puberty hit, this became a very urgent issue. And at about that time, our family got um, Look Magazine. This was in uh, January of 1970, which shows you how freaking old I am. And here with Steve McQueen's macho face smeared across the cover, uh, with an appeal to the president, this would be Richard Milhouse Nixon, uh, to unite the country, there was also an article on this new, bizarre, freaking, weird phenomenon, uh, transsexuals, male or female. Uh, I read that article and I saw myself, and it scared the hell out of me. Uh, I found that uh, all transsexuals were deeply troubled people who have to live extraordinarily complicated lives. If you read this article closely, you will find that they are deeply troubled people because they are almost always unable to get treatment. And they live extraordinarily complicated lives because if they do get treatment, they pretty much, in, as a price of getting treatment, they have to enter what I call the Trans Witness Protection Program. That is, in that day, this was actually part of the medical protocol, if you wanted to undergo any sort of treatment for uh, being transgender, you needed to go stealth, as we say, give up all connections to your former life. No one must ever know or something horrible will happen to you. This made quite an impression on me as a, as a, a, a very young teenager. Uh, in fact, it's interesting, when I ran across this article online about nine months ago, after four decades, I still had whole paragraphs of this committed to memory verbatim. Uh, so, faced with this information, I did, I made the sort of rational adult decision that any 13-year-old with absolutely no one to talk to did. I decided this could just not be me. I would just not let it happen. I wasn't this. Period. That's it. No problem. Um, and so um, I went in. Now, I struggled to fit in as a boy. And what I mean by this, in retrospect, that I can see is that I really wasn't comfortable trying to be a member of a group of boys. It just was never me. Uh, as I already mentioned, there was no chance that I was going to fit in with the girls. That was right out. So, in fact, the only third way open to me was with the handful of people who were sort of into science and doing things like that. Now, that's not to say if you're geeky, you're transgender, because that's clearly not true. But, in fact, we did have boys and girls there. There were a lot fewer, even in that time, a lot fewer of the sort of gender policing uh, episodes uh, than what you would get normally. So this was a way to survive, in a way. It was also very interesting. I mean, for us in those days, um, the technology that was accessible to us was uh, astronomy and telescopes. Uh, we ordered lenses, made telescopes, uh, ground uh, mirrors for reflectors. We did all of that stuff. It made us very, very, very strange kids uh, in central Nebraska back in that day. But at least they understood what we were. We were geeks and nerds, and that was, well, it wasn't really great, but okay. Uh, in fact, we were so weird that we would end up in the newspaper from time to time. Uh, one of my friends joked it must have been a slow news day. Trust me, central Nebraska in those days, pretty much every day was a slow news day. So. There I am on the right with my good friend Dave. Uh, we're still friends to this day. Uh, and by the way, you see the little note at the bottom? Cisgender people are always very interested in befores and afters with transgender people. Uh, what did you used to look like? What's your real name? Oh, that one really gets us going. Uh, and for transgender people in general, this is fairly uncomfortable. Uh, I just want to admit I am no exception to that. These are not comfortable things for me to show you. So, I was a geeky kid. I went on to be a geeky teenager, and to be a geeky young adult, and then a geeky adult. Uh, I got a PhD in Greek and Latin literature. Then, along the way, in a story that's really too complicated for a half-hour talk, uh, I ended up switching from being uh, a Latin teacher to a school technology director, software developer, a teacher, uh, chief DBA, uh, pretty much everything. So uh, I ended up doing a lot of programming starting in the uh, 
late 80s, uh, I programmed in uh, C, in Pascal, uh, in Visual Basic, I am ashamed to say. It was my only option for something, don't judge me. Uh, I did various things like that. Along the way, actually, open source came around, and I thought this was just great stuff. Um, I, I switched to Linux, I switched the school servers to Linux. That's the great thing about being the technology director, nobody can stop you. Uh, I started a lug. Um, I actually, at a Linux world, and Nathan and I were kind of trying to decide it was 2000 or 2001, uh, I learned Python. So in fact, at least a few of you may have met this guy here. He doesn't work here anymore. So I became involved in the Python community fairly early on. As a matter of fact, I think it was within three or four weeks of learning Python that we were teaching it uh, to ninth graders at the school I was at. Uh, that's because the alternative would have been teaching them something like Java, and that thought just made me cry. Uh, and it worked really well. Uh, I ended up teaching this to other teachers at state and national things. Um, I taught this to people at Linux Fest. Uh, it, it, it's a story that other people have to tell, too. Once we got started, we really wouldn't shut up. Um, I started speaking fairly early on. Again, uh, Nathan Yergel and I gave a talk at the first uh, PyCon that really was a PyCon back in 2003. We were just talking about that. Uh, I talked at some um, state and national uh, computer educator things. Uh, Jeff Elkner and I used to do kind of a road show to the National Educational Computer Coordinators Convention. Um, so I did things like that. I ended up doing some writing. Uh, my writing career was a little bit peculiar. I went from being the humor columnist for a dog training magazine uh, to working on, I'm not making that up, uh, I was on the cover once. Um, so uh, to um, uh, actually working on a couple of tech book projects. Uh, most recently, I did the second edition of the Quick Python book, uh, which sells well enough, thank God, that I actually get a little money for it, so I invite you to help that. Um, I uh, made the mistake of saying to Steve Holden when he was uh, chair of the PSF, you know, if there's anything I can ever do, and before I really even got that finished, uh, he said, yeah, you know, I'd really like a poster session at PyCon. Okay, I'd honestly never even seen a poster session, but the man had spoken, so we figured out how to do that. Uh, and through some twist of events that I haven't quite fathomed, uh, I ended up in the Python Software Foundation. So, basically, I was getting a lot from the Python community. This was something that I liked a lot. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Brett summed it up for a lot of us uh, when he said he came for the language and stayed for the community. Uh, this was really a good thing for me. The problem was, I was still transgender. And it's hard to describe what this is like. Uh, the whole phrase, born in the wrong body or trapped in the wrong body, is something made up by a journalist. It doesn't describe my experience, certainly. <laughs> Instead, the best analogy that I've been able to come up with so far is that if you know, you're really tired, and you know you've got a really long day the next day, and you can't sleep, and you lie in bed, and you think about how you need to sleep. And then you think about how you're wasting the time that you should be sleeping thinking about how you need to sleep. Then you think about how you're not going to think about needing to sleep, you're just going to sleep. And then you're back to thinking about how much you need to sleep. And you just sort of go through that for a while. It's like that every hour of every day, when you, for me at least it was, when you're transgender, you think about gender, I think about how much time I'm wasting thinking about gender, I think about how I'm not going to think about, and you're back. It just continually grinds away at you. So I started telling myself if I could just hold on until I died, it would be okay. The problem is I wasn't dying fast enough. Uh, and in fact, people think this is maybe me being a drama queen or something, 41% of transgender people attempt to kill themselves. This is just a fact because almost every trans person I've talked to has come to this point where the only way this is gonna end is when I die. Uh, that's not a generalization about transgender people particularly, by the way, that's a generalization about how we are treated. So, this led me to to, to think of some weird things. And I started thinking that the only thing that I could do was embrace my truth. And you notice I say my truth because the truth that society had been telling me or the world had been telling me was that I couldn't exist. Uh, and I decided that to do that would probably mean giving up everything. 
Remember, back at 13, I had absorbed this into my brain, that the only way you were going to get out of this was to basically leave everything. And this was a very painful thing to think about, but like a lot of trans people, I had come to the point where even if I lost everything, that was fine. So I started to think about other alternatives here. Um, I had toyed with the idea of doing the Education Summit as a farewell thing to the community. I would do it and then disappear, go into the Trans Witness Protection Program. The only problem was I actually started accelerating the pace of my transition because, well, it was just such a freaking relief to start moving in that direction, uh, that that wouldn't work. So I actually thought about what was for me, harking back to Liver and Cox, a very revolutionary th idea. What if I just did it and was open about it? Uh, first thing I looked at, codes of conduct. I looked for specifics. What happens to me if there is a problem, if I am harassed? This was important to me. Uh, other thing I did was I started telling a few people, uh, Jesse Noller, uh, Ava Yodloska, some people I would work with on PyCon, and they were all pretty cool with the idea. And the more I talked about it, the more I decided that I would go ahead and take that chance. So I did. Uh, I started by teaching at some uh, Python workshops for women. Uh, I spoke at some conferences. We went to PyCon. It was good. The education summit was fine. Okay, some of the people I worked with in organizing it were a little bit confused when the names on the emails changed. I apologize. Uh, but in general, it went pretty well. Um, in fact, the more open I was, the easier it was, on, it was for me, because I didn't have to worry about being outed, and it was easier for other people because they sort of knew what to expect. Uh, the other interesting sidelight is that when I told people, they sometimes felt an obligation to share some deep, dark secret about themselves, like I kind of trumped them and they had to, to answer back. Um, so my takeaway here is that we talk a lot about diversity, and that's real. So. Uh, we should be ending on this point, except that I'm, I'm a contrarian uh, in my old age. Uh, so it is not quite all rainbows and unicorns. Oh, or, as you might put it, this is kind of common in social justice circles right now, we don't get a cookie, uh, we, the Python community, quite yet. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the realities that remain. Uh, I am almost always the only openly trans person in, in the room. And we talked a little bit last night at the trans meetup about how weird it is to actually be in the company of many other trans people all in the same place. It's cool, but it's weird. Um, and by openly trans, UK government suggests that, or rather the UK government's official figure, which is the only official figure I've heard, is that 1% of the population is transgender in some way. And yet, People tell me all the time that I'm the only or the first trans person they've met. Somebody's not telling the truth. Uh, and they have very good reasons. They, they, they don't dare be out. Uh, I'm not real. I, was never, I never felt myself a real man. Now many people don't consider me a real woman. I am not real. Uh, I have become a thing, a curiosity, something so weird it's perfectly acceptable to ask me uh, who I love, how and when, uh, which bathroom I use, how and when, uh, all sorts of things like that that you wouldn't ask other people. Uh, there is sometimes a flinch factor in being seen with me. You can see friends, acquaintances, whatever. I think somehow they realize she's trans. People are going to realize she's trans. What are they going to think about me? This happens. Uh, I have lost friends virtually all but a couple of my family no longer speak to me. Um, a career, I spent over 20, well, over 25 years teaching. It's very frustrating for me to hear people talking about the need for educators who also know how to program, because in fact, the odds of me ever appearing in front of high school or middle school students again are virtually nil. And if you think I'm overstating that, you just think of how you would pitch that to your local neighborhood. Okay, um, more joy. Uh, when you're trans, you're always the punchline of an easy joke. If I never hear the punchline, and she used to be a dude, again in my life, I will still have more than a lifetime supply. Uh, there are issues with rights. There is a very heightened risk of violence. And as a, a, a white person of, of lots of privilege still, I have a job, I have money, all of that, I am far less likely to suffer this than a trans woman of color, but even so, relatively speaking, everybody's percentage goes up if you're a trans woman. This is all the price that I have to pay to be who I am. But honestly, I wouldn't change this if I could. It took me a long time to get here. 
But I'm at the place where now, if you offered me the chance to go back a uh, long, long time ago to central Nebraska and fix things, and I don't even know what that would mean, uh, I wouldn't take it. And that's partly because I think that as trans people, we have something that is very rare and very valuable. We've actually seen some of these things from both sides. Uh, in fact, what was surprising to me transitioning to, to, to uh, be perceived as a woman were all things that I thought I had figured out, that I thought I knew. Uh, and in fact, it's different when they really apply to you as opposed to just thinking about it. So I met some people who I thought were just amazingly brilliant that seemed to have no recognition whatsoever, that didn't feel like they were welcome, that didn't even always feel safe. In other words, I was in a different world. Um, and you know, some of these things, and, and this even was alluded to when we were, uh, people were talking at the pie ladies lunch, uh, now, in technical uh, contexts, not here, thank God, but in many others, certainly at work, uh, I'm the only woman in the room. Uh, I've now become invisible. This one was a real surprise to me. I was all worried about being harassed when I came to Python the first time uh, as a woman. No, I was invisible. Basically, almost every woman that I had even maybe interacted with on Twitter recognized me or interacted with me, and almost every guy, including people I had known for 10 years or more, looked right through me. I honestly, and, and, and again, it's sorry, but this is true, I honestly had to step in front of some of these people and yell at them to get them to see me. I mean, and it's, it's not as though they didn't know I had transitioned or anything like that. Uh, so, and, and I've actually done some looking around. This is actually a fairly common thing. Uh, men are kind of trained not to pay attention to women in professional settings. So this is, it's just, I, I found it to be true. Uh, I am now always judged by my appearance as anyone else female in the room will be able to talk about at great length, uh, I cannot assume personal security anymore. This is something that I think as a guy you don't even think about. You go where you want, when you want. I can't do that anymore. Uh, double standards are, are now the norm. As a guy, I used to be um, just a nice guy. Nah, just a nice guy. Uh, as, as a woman, shortly after I transitioned, I got feedback both that I was too nice and I was unapproachable at the same freaking time. I, I don't know how to do that. So these are all things that kind of have to do with being marginalized. And so if you're not, a, if you're not marginalized, you don't understand that you know, the things that you want for a conference, for a space, for anything, tend to be viewed by the group as extra. And you're not always sure if you're welcome. Um, if you object to something, and these are all sort of from my experiences interacting particularly on, uh, with, with people in the Python community even, uh, if you object to something, you're angry and probably your bad attitude is hurting your cause. Um, and, and being angry can be, it's like just sort of, no, I just said this, I'm not. Um, you can if you call somebody out, these are two words that I really hate, you can be bullying people with political correctness or starting a witch hunt. Uh, I've never seen anybody start a real witch hunt. Uh, these both strike me as people who are privileged, who don't want things to change. This is what I see when I see those words. And no matter what kind of blowback you get, you started it. And we have seen this in the PyCon world many times. We've seen it on the tech world. We get a big blow up this way probably every six to nine months in the tech world. This just happens. So those are all of the things that are going on. In the business world, and I know this because I had to go through when I, I transitioned, we talked about this at great length, there's a business case for diversity. Uh, businesses now know, and the business that I work with, I'm the only out transgender person in uh, North America out of 16,000 employees. Okay, it's a very old 85-year-old conservative company. They have a party line that diverse groups cause, solve problems better and that we need every single talented employee we can get. We don't want to lose the people we have already. We want the biggest possible employee pool. All of those things are the standard business case for uh, diversity. So this should also then be true. This should be even more true in the open source and Python communities. Uh, and, you know, I honestly, I, I was not able to catch uh, Guido's keynote, but I gathered that's exactly what he said. I want to go listen to that part, definitely. Um, if we're talking about being open, which we do all the time, that necessarily implies uh, 
you know, the notion of inclusion and diversity. So here again, I, uh, th and, and the we is in question marks because these, I am not speaking for every marginalized person in the world. I am just trying to get you an idea of some things that occur to me. What do we want? How can you shut us up? How can you keep us from being so irritating? Um, okay. Here, here are some things. First of all, understand that everyone is different. And I don't mean this in the sense of diversity where we're going to get a certain predetermined ratio of genders and colors and things like that. I mean, everyone is different in a myriad of different ways. All right? We have a whole, like, enormous bank of different little settings, all that can be different. Uh, you can have sexuality set here. You can have gender identity set here, race set here, religion here, all of these things, and they are not connected. The fact that two people happen to have their sexuality setting in the, more or less the same place, whatever that might be, says nothing about the rest of it. I think the more that we embrace this fact, the more that a lot of the other issues go away. Oops, excuse me. Um, listen to us. Lots of social justice movements now have kind of a little motto, nothing about us without us. Uh, codes of conduct. Uh, Codes of conduct that actually say something real are very important. Codes of conduct that say, trust us, we're all nice guys, don't. In fact, those make me angry because that's missing the entire point of a code of conduct. Uh, outreach matters. Uh, I, I need to thank, uh, I would never have given this talk anywhere if somebody hadn't asked me to do it. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be giving it here if Jessica hadn't asked me to give a talk. I don't think this was the one she was bargaining on, but she's been very gracious about it. Um, outreach matters. Uh, allies matter. Uh, this is important. I have never witnessed in decades being undercover as a cisgender person and being undercover as a male person. I have never witnessed when, when, when it's just that group. I have never witnessed somebody standing up to say, no, that, you really shouldn't do that. That's transphobic. Or no, you really shouldn't do that. That's sexist. I'm not saying it's never happened. I'm saying for decades, I've never seen it. We need allies that will actually do that. Uh, safe spaces, spaces where you can go one way or another, whether it's all trans or all women or whatever, or if it's some other strategy, ways to make yourself comfortable so that you'll take part are very, very important. So, to conclude, if we're going to throw around words like open, fair, inclusion, inclusive, things like that, I would argue those have to be true for everyone. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Now I am freaked out. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We have time for like one or two questions, but one or two, yeah? Sure, so thank you so much for sharing those experiences. Um, one thing that I have noticed in the community, and not everyone does this, but um, people who are in a marginalized group often feel very threatened to the point where if they genuinely are being a jerk to someone and you say, hey, stop that, you're being a jerk to them, just the way that you would say that to any non-marginalized person, they go, you're assaulting my identity, rather than going, you're criticizing my behavior. Do you have any suggestions on how one can give them that feedback to maintain a non-hostile community when that hostility is coming from a marginalized group? Um, I don't, I mean, I guess the thing that I would like if, if I were doing that in that case, and if it really was sort of that threatening uh, a, a situation or somebody that is really clearly that, um, you know, felt that way, is that maybe this would be done sort of in a very low key kind of private way first. I mean, I, I, I hesitate to say, oh, well, you know, we deserve special treatment or something like that. But if you've got somebody who's scared already, then maybe keeping things very low level might be a way to start. But I, I don't know, it depends. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. One more. Uh, hi, um, you were talking about the experience of being invisible or feeling invisible when you came to the conference. And I wonder um, uh, if that, in some way for some people who might have been looking right through you, if it was uh, <clears throat> a flip side reaction to not wanting to stare or not knowing how to relate to you, like do you think that there was 
that kind of misunderstanding going on, or how how would you? No, I I I, I considered that, but the vast majority of them, they really they looked sort of right at me and then right on through me. Mm. And and it, it it really was almost surprising. It wasn't one of these sort of. It was just sort of, mm. and and the, their reactions of complete surprise when I actually would say something, tended to confirm that. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you again. The next talk in this room is Marina uh, talking about the Gnome Outreach Program for Women. Get out of here.